If it doesn't want to load, we can just I can just run the slides for you, Adam. And just let me know when to move forward. OK, I will. I'll do this. I think I think say, say maybe say next slide just in case. <laughs> I, I will. I think yeah, you're, I think you're exactly. kidding, but just in case. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> just in case we all get mesmerized by the by the slides, the uh, um, you know, just, just for the for, for the for the for the group, uh, you may all know Dr. Murphy, but if you don't, he's an assistant professor of urology and also preventive medicine. Um, he's an expert in in um, an expert trialist and uh, in biomarkers. He's had uh, multiple trials that have been successful in recruiting minority populations and. You know, that's obviously a um, important for, for so many reasons, um, but certainly a focus um, of, of our group and of, of the NCI. And so we thought we would take the opportunity and gracious enough to give us the, the chance to talk to us a little bit about, you know, how he's been successful at, at doing doing that, some of the barriers, strategies and other things that he's worked on. Um, I think um, just for the sake of the audience, let's just give them one more minute and then you can please uh, uh, go ahead, Dr. Murphy. And thanks again for, for sharing your time with us. No problem. Thank you for the invitation. A lot of people in the room actually have helped me, <laughs> me do this. So it's actually kind of funny to recruit, to be talking to my group. <laughs> Dr. Murphy, do you want me to run the slides for you? Yeah, because it never actually stopped doing the spinning wheel of death. Can you see them here? Mm, I can. Perfect. Great, okay, great. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. People may straggle in, but um, um, go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll put in the chat the code to text if people want to uh, um, claim CME. Okay. All right. Um, can you make it full screen, Mary Kate, or, or maybe a little bit bigger? I don't know if that's possible. Okay, cool. It's a PDF. All right, well, good evening. Uh, I'm Adam Murphy, uh, and most of you actually know me, and many of you have helped me along the way, actually, uh, in doing this work. Uh, basically, I um, am kind of half urologist, half uh, basic have clinical researcher uh, focused on prostate cancer disparities. Uh, and I got the fortune of working with Dr. Bill Catalona and Dr. Rick Kittles on my initial research uh, that got me a physician research training award. And I had the time to basically uh, do a two week NIH uh, kind of health disparities uh, boot camp uh, down in Meharry in, in Nashville. And I've been using a lot of the information I got from that and some of the experiences I've got at Northwestern and in the city of Chicago to become fairly proficient at doing this work. So next slide. Um, this is from the NCI's uh, cancer.gov page. They actually spotlighted the research we did, uh, which was the first time for me doing this. Uh, we had a, a completely all African American team of researchers and research coordinators. Uh, we basically did a validation of uh, prostate health index uh, in African Americans. Uh, we recruited 140 uh, African American uh, healthy controls from the community using the social network of eight lay African American men, uh, and we trained them to be uh, city trained. Uh, we uh, actually trained them to be research coordinators, and they used snowball technique to essentially recruit 140 men in, in nine months from the community, from their social networks. Uh, and so it was a, we had a, a multi-PI team. Uh, this was funded by uh, Melissa Simon's uh, Chicago Check grant as a pilot study, a two-year pilot. Uh, and so it got paired with, um, uh, funding from the V Foundation to do a clinical validation in the biopsy in a biopsy cohort recruited at Northwestern, Cook County Health, and and, and uh, University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, but we also did this community arm, which is what's focused on the NCI website. So um, 
I basically have this kind of split role where I am uh, a researcher at Northwestern. I have a lab at the VA, uh, but I also work clinically at the VA and at, uh, for the Cook County Health System, uh, working mostly at Providence Hospital, but a little bit at Cook County Stroger Hospital. Next. Um, this is how I got my start, and the reason why I feature this uh, uh, is because of the fact that it was a simple study. It was essentially people went and got prostate biopsies. Uh, our coordinators would uh, get to them right before the biopsy, draw their blood, ask a few short surveys, um, and then the patients would be done. Uh, and Dr. Catalona is on this uh, paper uh, as my senior mentor, and Rick Kittles is my secondary mentor for this. Uh, this is one of the uh, outputs of my DOD Research Training Award. So next slide. And the reason why I, I highlight this paper is because we had, uh, out of 667 participants, there were equal numbers of African Americans and whites, we termed European American for this study. We got 119 others, which are mostly Hispanics. Um, what we were able to show was that vitamin D was associated with prostate biopsy outcomes, more so in African Americans than in uh, whites, uh, which show uh, the importance of having a subgroup analysis take place because we didn't actually find an, a strong effect on prostate cancer diagnosis in whites. It was only in the aggressiveness having higher grade tumors in this group. Next. So uh, this was me uh, getting to the big leagues in a real clinical trial that had uh, actually four patient visits, including one study visit that was not tied to a clinical visit. Uh, this was at UIC, uh, this recruited at UIC, uh, Cook County Health, and uh, Jesse Brown VA. There was no recruitment actually in Northwestern on this study because there were two competing other studies at the time in the active surveillance space. One was on, I think, genetic predictors of active surveillance, um, maybe progression. Uh, and so we couldn't, uh, it didn't make sense to do it. And it ended up being a really enriching experience uh, because uh, it was uh, a first complicated clinical trial with multiple visits for me and really working with uh, kind of a more difficult complex study design. Okay, uh, it was a simple randomized controlled trial using Archetype DX. And I highlight this, uh, the, the racial breakdown in red here because we had uh, a cohort of active surveillance eligible men. There were 200 recruited and randomized. And 140 of those 200 men were African American. Uh, and 25 of them, or 12 and a half percent, were Hispanic. So we exceeded um, kind of racial um, composition standards for clinical trials in this one. But it was a, it was strategic in where we recruited uh, in this study a lot. And so uh, we got a veterans hospital, a county hospital, and another safety net at UIC. Next. So I think we all know the problem. Uh, I think in about 20 years ago, 1993, um, the, the NIH made this uh, kind of act, revitalization act to essentially uh, uh, require that investigators um, kind of make a plan to include women and ethnic minorities into the research that they were funding. Uh, and that really has not improved by much. Uh, only about 2% of those, of 10,000 trials actually met uh, minority participant patient kind of goals. Uh, and of the ones that have been done, uh, there were 782 randomized trials and only 13.4% of them actually reported on race uh, as out for their primary endpoints. So, this is in contrast to actually what patients want. Uh, if you poll patients, it sounds like Hispanics are actually more willing than whites to en enroll in, in clinical trials and, and blacks uh, say that they would participate at equal rates as whites. Um, so it's not the Tuskegee problem that people 
kind of really mentioned a lot. Uh, and although we have had some increase in African American enrollments, they're up to 15% of phase one clinical trials. It's only 4% in phase three trials. Um, so it's not um, improved across, uh, especially when you want to use these drugs in actual patients. It's not really, they're not well represented there. And there's been some, some issues with that where 5-FU uh, caused a lot more leukopenia and uh, thrombopenia, thrombocytopenia in African Americans and it wasn't discovered during the clinical trials phase uh, when they were using it for lung cancer treatment. So uh, what patients actually say is that they're not given access to clinical trials. Uh, and I guess that can be for multiple reasons. Some that have been named are that, that African Americans and Hispanics have more comorbidities, uh, and so they're ineligible often, or they, they're uninsured and there will be some out-of-pocket costs in some trials uh, if they were not insured. And then I believe that physician time limits uh, uh, play into this because if you believe a patient has a language barrier or a health literacy barriers, it may take more time than we have in clinics sometimes to get folks enrolled. Next. So uh, looking over multiple papers, uh, I found that these are the key barriers that people kind of repeatedly pointed to. Um, there were physician barriers, patient barriers, and kind of systemic higher level barriers. Uh, and, and so for, yeah, physicians kind of are viewed as a primary triager of patients, whether they would be someone a coordinator should talk to or not, or they should talk to. Uh, and also, um, physicians aren't always aware of the exclusion criteria or inclusion criteria and may uh, exclude uh, patients uh, un unintentionally because of that. Uh, there are patient barriers. Theirs are fear of what's going to happen to them in the study, which uh, and then, you know, distrust in the medical community is often cited. Uh, I believe that those can be modified by talking to the patient about it so they, they are more aware uh, of what's going to happen to them in, on the study. Uh, and then also physicians uh, could, I believe, in their own relationships with the, their patients can modify a lot of them. Mistrust. So they may mistrust the entire community but they may trust their individual physician. Uh, and then there's burdens associated with participating in the trial that we have to kind of ease for uh, underserved populations. I also think that systemic barriers are, are really there. Um, one big one was kind of refer outside hospitals, outside providers are nervous about sending their insured uh, patients to uh, Northwestern because they may keep their patients or poach them. Uh, and also sometimes people complain about wait times getting into the system. Um, and then in general, uh, with physician burnout kind of in the news a lot, uh, and precision mass medicine making trials sometimes more complicated, where they have very, very um, rigorous designs where it alters based off of a biomarker or a biopsy result. And so there's and there are there more imaging involved or more biopsies involved. Uh, it's more cumbersome for the systems too. Next. OK, so what are some good things? What are some facilitators of participation? What encourages people? I think physician enthusiasm, and that's well born out in the literature. An, an excited doctor talking about the study uh, is more motivating for the for the patients. Uh, Obviously, communicating well, a good relationship, uh, having there be a perceived benefit, which I think is we're supposed to present kind of equipoise about our research questions. Uh, but there's also this potential that this new agent or new uh, intervention may improve your outcomes. Uh, so I guess it's a it's a potential perceived benefit. And I think one that really does matter is people feeling altruistic about. Uh, this may not be helping you, but it may help your son, your grandson, or people like you in your community. But I think there, are, a lot of the literature is missing uh, kind of a key point uh, um, that 
is is obvious, but it's never really mentioned in the literature. Next. Next slide. I think they're missing the coordinators. Um, people uh, forget that not everyone is comfortable talking to people outside of their own ethnic group or racial group. So it's that is seen by how people choose to select uh, physicians. If they, um, it, it, it's true in who people befriend. It's true in who people sit next to at the lunchroom. That people tend to self-select or sort by different tribal groups, male, female, uh, race, ethnicity, language. Uh, and so I think that one thing that we've worked on is, is really hiring coordinators that were willing to go out into the community with me and do outreach. And I tell people up front that I'm going to the south or west side or I'm focused on African-Americans or Hispanics um or everybody but that that it's required that they interact with people from other groups uh that part is something that i've had to be really intentional about because if if patients are saying they're not even being given access and oftentimes coordinators are screening i noticed initially that the rates of people who were being initially approached uh, for the study were lower for the minorities and for the, the Caucasian patients. So we do biopsy tracking where we see everyone who had a biopsy, how many of them were eligible, how many did the coordinator actually attempt to enroll, and then how many they got enrolled. Initially, the numbers of minorities that were attempted were lower. And I think that that is about coordinator comfort. And so we had to do a lot of training of our coordinators and we picked them to be multilingual, kind of naturally interested in diversity, willing to go into the community. The ones that already were kind of focused on social justice issues or picked my lab to apply to because of it was a plus. Um, but even if they are interested, we still did a lot of training around cultural competence. Next. So I'm just going to detail some of the things that I think were important in the coordinated training. Uh, we talked about systemic racism before it was a thing uh, to kind of say naturally because of the fact that uh, people who they may be recruiting may have lower health literacy or they may be more distrustful and not to be offended by that, that level of skepticism that a patient may present them with. Um, uh, I, we, I did this research for my uh, wife when she was applying for her uh, job at Adler University, and uh, we basically had to figure out why, wh what were the issues around minority uh, retention in the faculty and in the grad school there. And uh, what we found out was that uh, uh, Blacks and Hispanics had more stressful events uh, that would occur over the course of one year. So, you know, it could be a divorce or a car accident or um, someone in the family was ill. Uh, they they tally those up for a, a bunch of grad students, about 100 grad students over a year in each racial category and found that on average, whites had about four uh, stressful life events a year. Hispanics had about six and African-Americans had about eight in the average year. Um, and so, those stressful events would oftentimes take people out of the grad school program or they would the grades would suffer as a result. And so just trying to make research easier, given that these stresses are happening more often, uh, was something that I had to remind my, my coordinators about. Uh, and making them know that research may look like a lower priority in the lives of your minority patients. Um, and they also have increased barriers to care with insurance and language barriers. And so I thought it was our responsibility as researchers to help them reduce that burden. And so that's kind of how a lot of the suggestions come along. Uh, next. Uh, so when I interviewed my coordinators, I specifically asked about their comfort in other settings. 
uh, I kind of told them that we would do it in safe spaces, but that we are really having a lot of community events uh, on the west side of Chicago at a church on a Sunday. Uh, and you may be the only person of your race in that setting. Uh, and, and the people who I guess enlist uh, are the people who really uh, made, made uh, the lab work out so well. Uh, so I screened actually for some issue, some passion around social justice or equity. And I purposely diversified my team around the languages that I wanted to recruit into the study. Next. So this was just uh, on the right talking about the number of stressful events that were happening uh, by race during the COVID-19 crisis. And you can see blacks and Hispanics at the bottom at the darker blue color. I'm sorry, middle blue and kind of darker blue are black, Hispanic and other race. Uh, and you can see that the blacks, Hispanics and other racial groups had higher levels of uh, social determinants of health stressors happened during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I think that's just to drive home the point about the importance of coordinators lowering the barriers uh, for a lot of these access issues with, with the patients. So the, the coordinators were trained as, as patient navigators. Um, they would, there was a, a patient navigation boot camp at UIC that several of my coordinators did for the um, U54 uh, validation of private health index. They would give reminder calls two to three days before an appointment or, or a, an MRI, for example, to make sure that they got there. Uh, if they had to reschedule their appointment because if something came up, they would work with the, the clinic schedulers and the physicians to allow for them to be seen still within the, the framework of the, the study. Uh, and sometimes we have to bounce other people back or overbook a clinic to make sure that they made it in. Uh, and if they got there, we would have the patients meet with the coordinators early. So when they're waiting, uh, they would get surveys and blood draw and things like that done uh, so that the waiting wasn't just in the lobby. Um, we oftentimes worked with uh, federally qualified health centers in Cook County to take people that we've screened in the community for elevated PSA. If they if we could not get them insurance uh, because they didn't qualify for an Affordable Care Act plan, we would send them to one of the federally qualified health centers to set them up with a primary care doctor, or we would send them to a mile square center, um, or I, I would see them myself at Cook County Health. Uh, at Northwestern, often uh, several of the urologists, including Dr. Catalona, Meeks, Schaefer, have seen some of my uh, community referrals too. But we wanted to have all around kind of safety nets for these people that we were recruiting. Um, and we had to prepare our coordinator to, to, for these increased educational burdens because oftentimes patients would be sitting there outside the biopsy clinic looking mortified nervous, they didn't know what a prostate biopsy was, despite meeting with their urologist a week before or two weeks before. And so just teaching the coordinators what a biopsy is, um, what a radical prostatectomy is, what is active surveillance, sometimes they could actually allay some of the fears of the patients. And by improving their health literacy, they can make more informed decisions about their, their participation in the research. Next. So as you know, we got our coordinators out there. Uh, in one summer, uh, in eight months, we recruited 140 African-American men for uh, the five validation study. And during that time, these, these coordinators are getting to improve their blood draw skills. Uh, they're getting to increase their comfort with uh, minorities and other ethnic group uh, men and families uh, and they improve in their spiel because they have to do good salesmanship to recruit people in a mega health event where there's people giving having giveaways there's shows on the stage so I think it improved our, our coordinators ability to 
kind of talk to people and, and sell the study a little bit. Uh, and then we always collected the names uh, and, and emails and contact information for all these participants, people who walked up to us for education purposes, because we could enroll them in other studies. It, it, you know, that's one of the check boxes. Are you insured? And are you willing to be contacted for future research? And that helps uh, us fill out folks for future events. Um, and also provided a national referral system for other studies when they had elevated PSA and came over to the clinics. Next. So these are, we, I talked about the key barriers. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the solutions that I think that they're, they exist. Next. So, you know, for the physicians, uh, trying to have the coordinators pre-screened by going through the providers' uh, schedules for the day, seeing who's eligible and reminding the providers about it uh, kind of um, eliminates the, the physicians kind of trying to hold the, the inclusion and exclusion criteria in their head. Uh, and it also deals with some of the time issues that the physician has so that um, they don't have to think about adding this patient to the study and grab a consent form and go through a spiel. They can hand them off uh, to a coordinator. So the coordinator pre-screens, informs the, the provider that this person is eligible, this person's an ethnic minority, we need this number, uh, and the physicians then can, uh, can discuss the study with their patients. Uh, if they have time or just do a nice warm handoff to the coordinators. Um, and then the other thing is if this if it's about insurance uh, or needing supplemental insurance, uh, it's nice when uh, at the other sites like at UIC um, or at Cook County, these patients, because they need the insurance anyway, are oftentimes seeing the financial counselors. And if they need supplemental insurance to get through this treatment, they may be advised to do so. Uh, if they need to get on a, a charity care program, that's when that would happen and will allow for them to be on study oftentimes. Um, and then I just think the physician knowledge part is just having coordinators around pre-screening to remind uh, physicians when they're busy of the eligibility criteria uh, and also reminding people them about what this study is about. So it's not just on the on the clinician. And then if, if they're and also to highlight where we are in terms of accrual goals, like where are where are the urgent needs in terms of uh, racial um, breakdowns and the people who've been enrolled so far. Next. In terms of the patient barriers, I think it's about um, really uh, dealing with their trust. Uh, and their fear, um, which is really interpersonal. So the fear, I think, is a bit of the coordinators uh, and, and having study brochures uh, that are available and allowing for patients to have, uh, to have the consent, take it home with them, discuss it with family, so that it's less of an acute issue and the coordinator can follow back up later by phone to kind of close the deal. Um, I think physicians, by asking their patients uh, and really just working on their relationship, that deals with a lot of the mistrust in the medical community. And then uh, whatever we can do to kind of reduce the burdens of trial participation. So when I do my studies, I try and pair as anyone does, as many of those in-person visits to uh, urology visits as as much as possible, um, and to make the the uh, appointment sometimes convenient, we will arrange uh, rearrange the appointments so that the patient can more uh, certainly get there, or their ride can be there to bring them and take them home. Uh, we've also done a lot of providing venture cards and parking validation to patients. Uh, it often helps if the coordinators can have a space in their also the side in the clinic to bring patients before uh, the appointment or after the appointment that doesn't interfere with 
uh, cl uh, clinic flows. Uh, and we oftentimes, because the coordinators call, will bring the patient in again to do the surveys and blood draws before they have to go to the clinic. Bring them in 45 minutes early. Uh, and we reserve money in the budget for Ubers and cab costs and uh, can even arrange medical transport for people who don't have uh, help uh, to, to go back home after a visit. Uh, or they're later than their ride and they had to leave and we had to send them home a different way. So our coordinators are trained to do that. Next. So the systemic barriers are, are a little bit uh, harder to overcome. Uh, I think things are getting harder uh, for patients to be involved because there's a lot more kind of tissue and specimen collection and a lot of uh, imaging now, which you know, are, is great to increase, but it means that oftentimes patients have to come back uh, additional times. Uh, and so it can be burdensome to to people who have difficulties with access to care. So if you're going to start doing this work, I really suggest simpler studies uh, to start implementing some of these changes. Um, the one or two bits of studies are a good practicing ground, uh, which is why I showed the study that we did uh, in 2014 uh, looking at vitamin D in the biopsy clinic. One time study, 40% uh, um, African American enrollment, and, and I think 16% Hispanic enrollment. Uh, but it was a one, it was a one visit study. Uh, I think we've kind of grown in our ability to manage clinical trials. It was not built in one day. Uh, and I think, you know, really the only way to get around the issues with the external referrals. Uh, I believe is to make trusting relationships with um, strategic partners because they, you know, I have hematology oncology friends that are in private practice and they don't feel comfortable necessarily always uh, sending their patients to the big academic medical centers when they feel like they can manage it in their own practices. But, you know, sometimes it's difficult to have the latest trials in certain community offices. So it's really about kind of, if you can, building some strategic partners with people who are high volume, have minority patients, uh, um, and have most of the infrastructure in place, and you can maybe build on it a little. Uh, next. So I've had this experience several times where the when I first started doing my work at Cook County, uh, there was not a centrifuge and pipettes there to kind of prep our Buffy coat for DNA collection. We've that's been built up over time. Uh, some of it we've helped to provide equipment. Some of it has been them doing it on their own, but developing the shared vision of being able to do more and more studies. So they wanted to, their goal was to build um infrastructure to be able to do pharma trials well and our goal was to be able to do minority recruitment and in, 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 in prostate cancer so we kind of developed this parallel plan about how to get both of our uh, kind of needs met and they wanted to have research coordinators and maybe a research nurse so i started to put that in the budget so that we could have full time and then uh coordinators and then eventually we got to where we can just have uh, part-time effort on, on certain grants so that we can keep it kind of always uh, staffed. Um, we tried to do as much as we could to deal with the fact that there was, they didn't have certifications. We uh, try to bring the community, to, uh, the Center for Community Health in Northwestern to some folks to allow for them to be trained with the in-person visits. Uh, instead of actually having to go on to the city website and got a Northwestern certification for their city training through that that means. That's been working with certain community sites. Um, the, the best partnership has been with Cook County Health for me. Um, their chair there was well-trained. 
had a residency program that he wanted to see uh, be able to provide opportunities for research for those folks. Uh, and in the community, the community practices were people who just wanted to be involved in cutting edge research. They thought it was good to, to advertise that. And so that's who I partnered with on some of the uh, other grants as, as kind of uh, community sites. Um, and really it was a lot of uh, partnership building in our initial meetings, trying to figure out a shared vision. Next. So we had several meetings uh, to build out that vision. Uh, and it was about kind of what were the needs uh, to get the studies done. Um, you know, what, what, what staffing, what supplies, what storage, what refrigeration. Um, and also we had to decide about how authorship would go. Uh, and uh, we agreed on budgets and we we're trying to be transparent about what was included in the budgets and uh, started with a sense of fairness uh, in talking about it. So I also consulted with the, the community sites uh, about how I can make my research better. So I would present a specific aims page. They would tell me their, uh, what's exciting about it, what sounds weak about it. And also during that time, we would oftentimes figure out what would be uh, what would be feasible to conduct in their sites. And, and, and that oftentimes shaped how I would format uh, the, the timeline, I mean, uh, the flow charts of the study. Um, figuring out how the clinic flows, how often people kind of would follow up, um, how people would manage active surveillance, for example, would help me figure out how to actually, wh what I could actually get done. Um, in the beginning, and then I, they've gotten more complex over time. Next. Uh, the, I guess uh, we started to, as we talked about kind of the ideas of the, of the type of research we would do together, I started presenting, uh, you know, RFAs uh, to them and said, and presented an initial idea. Uh, we figured out what would be needed to, to do it successfully there. And uh, I helped uh, get uh, some of the Euronav equipment, uh, you know, biopsy, the, the right biopsy gun, uh, the right um, uh, probe tracker holders, uh, and put that into my NIH grant budget um, so that we knew up front that we were going to have that by the time this started. Um, of course, we pay for coordinators, uh, but I also did a lot of other things like help format biosketches, draft letters of support, uh, write up statements of work, uh, and then work with their physical sponsor oftentimes to make sure that we were sticking to timelines. Uh, in fact, um, it happened with a project that uh, Dr. Ross was working on over at, at, at Stroger. Uh, I kind of had to help pull it, monitor it to make sure that we kind of got it out on time. Uh, and so this is labor intensive. Uh, it is not always easy. Um, and a lot of these sites are, are cash strapped or are personnel strapped. So there was, but we've come a long way in the time working together. Next. So really it just it was about building trust through regular meetings. Uh, kind of planning out our grant ideas together uh, and gathering whether they were interested in what idea I had and they oftentimes helped me refine it for what they thought would make it more competitive, but also refine it for their sites to see what was feasible. And, you know, it always helped to have an understanding of what the competing studies were and how, if we needed more than one site or can we rely on just that one site? So anyway, it was a lot of conversation back and forth, and we just had to re recognize that it was a, a two-way street, uh, and that um, I had to make sure that we would have authorship kind of agreements uh, up front, and when there was a research topic that they wanted me to support as a co-investigator or reading over uh, their own applications for a grant, I oftentimes did that too. So. Next. 
Um, we're coming to the end. Uh, I think that, you know, what can we do in our practices? Well, uh, one thing that I saw happen was when we initially started recruiting at Northwestern for this five validation study, uh, it was, you know, around 2016. And the Affordable Care Act plans, there were about 13 of them going in Chicago. And as I realized it, Northwest was a pretty early adopter of many of them. So our Black enrollment and our Hispanic enrollment went up quite a bit uh, uh, on several studies for several years. And then um, I guess the process had become so cumbersome where each of the different Affordable Care Act plans had different kind of uh, requirements for, for getting the billing in correctly. And so uh, the hospital and many hospitals across the country, uh, and especially in Illinois, would stop accepting many of the plans. So I think we went from 13 plans to six in the course of a year. And so our African-American enrollment plummeted again. So if you, if there's a person who has a practice that they have some control over, over which uh, plan they can, you know, accept. Um, it may be that we, you can strategically look through which plans, you know, would bring it or are popular would bring in uh, minorities uh, and have a decent reimbursement rate that you may be willing to entertain uh, because there are going to be a lot of ethnic minorities on those plans, and so that may be one way to get around some of the the, the input issues. But I do think that we can prioritize rescheduling uh, missed appointments uh, for people who would be potential research participants, uh, or if they, you know they have to miss it, don't make them wait another three months, try and bring them back in uh, sooner. And I think that that's a great role for the coordinators to be playing, uh, which they have done uh, in several studies for me. Um, this one may be harder to implement, but having the financial counselors and ability to be aware the cost impacts. Uh, we have a study on prostate MRI, and we're going to be working with the billers, uh, mostly at Stroger and, and at um, UIC, around which which plans will accept, uh, will authorize a prostate MRI before uh, an initial biopsy and biopsy naive patients. So we're we're going to be working on, on that and, and our team the, between the docs and the coordinators. Uh, and But we would also work with the, the counselors to see which ones are more likely to accept it. And unfortunately, we have to make some decisions because we are definitely going to include insured people and uninsured people, but, but the limit, there's a limit on the number of uninsured people we can accept into this study. So we we actually put into our NIH budget room for about 12 prostate MRIs a year over the five-year grant period to get some more uninsured patients into the study. So yes, it ate into our budget, um, but I thought it was important because we were specifically enrolling uh, African-American and Hispanics into the study. So I needed to have some room to allow for that. Next. So, you know, I think just when we're writing our own grants and proposals, I think if we take a little bit more seriously the inclusion of minorities and women uh, in our planning phase when we're writing it, uh, it would really go a lot further. I've been sitting on some review panels and people give kind of a cursory lip service to recruitment of minorities in their studies or they don't say anything at all. And um, I had the fortune of sitting on the Cancer Moonshot Biobank uh, panel as well. And unless you are intentional about it at first, it's oftentimes an afterthought. And people will find themselves looking for samples uh, or, or patients at the last minute, but they needed to have made the partnerships before the grant went out. So I would encourage people to think about partnering with minority serving sites, or figuring out how they can, uh, in their own site, really target the minorities better. Um, one way to do it is through community advisory boards of, of patients. So if you have a minority patient who is grateful for 
the work you did with them and they want to help out in some way, oftentimes they are, they make great readers of flyers, of study brochures to help you uh, better target your information that you hand out to the minority populations. And so putting them on the materials uh, so that people can relate to it has been something that I think is really helpful. Uh, and, and they may be able to even refer friends in who they know have their same diagnosis because people talk to others, either in support groups or just in their family and friends network uh, or churches back to uh, your clinic. Um, so that's how they can help. Uh, and then I think you have to kind of build into the budgets a certain amount of money for uninsured participants to take it to, to take effect. And the NIH has been responsive to me writing that into my grant proposals. Um, they knew I allow for it. We were recruiting 250 Hispanics and 250 African Americans for kind of a validation of prostate health index and prostate MRI in biopsy naive patients. So, um, you know, they saw that that was a line item and I wrote it in there and they considered it a, an approach strength. Um, next. So I think that that physicians should be asking their patients uh, to participate, personally asking them. That's what they meant the, the, the patients were saying was often not happening, that their providers were not referring them to studies often. Uh, and I think that's barrier number one. Uh, I think you can ask and then have a, a coordinator do the follow up, but I do think that it requires this personal relationship. Uh, and then to explain the question that's being asked, uh, maybe planting the seeds with patients in early visits by handing information about that disease or treatments or the study. Uh, would be a way to, on the next time, prime them to be ready for talking about it. Um, I also think that uh, oftentimes minorities are, as African Americans are worried about giving their DNA or RNA uh, and genetic data to, to people to be used in, uh, indefinitely. Uh, I have had very few people refuse, but I always leave on the consent forms uh, and discuss that they don't have to consent to let their samples be used for future research. I think it gives people comfort at the idea that they could say no. Um, and you know, when you want to look at look at your materials to see if it's actually uh, you know, written at a level that most people can understand and looks friendly to ethnic minorities. Uh, we have a Center for Community Health in Northwestern that has provided me with great suggestions and they actually um, did a sharp panel, which is like a focus group to uh, to in, to tell me how to do the recruitment using the citizen scientists. Um, so it was a very good consultation they gave me uh, and they've helped me with language tailoring, uh, recommending translators for a Spanish translation as well. Next. And I just think that we all can, you know, work on the system by being an advocate uh, for minority recruitment. And when I was in my review panel last week, uh, it came up several times uh, that there was no mention of uh, the racial breakdown of the patients that they were recruiting on renal cell carcinoma biomarkers uh, or on um, prostate cancer biomarkers that they were developing. Um, but I think that's inappropriate when there are diseases that have high prevalences in minority groups that are not really being addressed at all. I think it worsens disparities and is using public dollars to do it. Um, so I think it's important to remind our colleagues about the importance of minority inclusion up front when we're writing it and when we are submitting to the IRB and when we are reviewing these grants. Um, and I think that it's especially important in diseases that really do have a, uh, a minority group that's uh, at much higher risk than average. Next. 
Uh, I think the other thing is to uh, encourage our ethnic minority patients to get involved in research because it's, it's easy to talk about the fact that disparities would widen if they did not. And that, that really their involvement is, is, has helped uh, make sure that the treatments that we are coming up with are generalizable. Uh, and, and I encourage people to refer people from their network to participate. Uh, and you can even talk about the fact that it's important that they have insurance because there would be out of pocket costs for those patients otherwise. And if you just take a minute to explain the study uh, conceptually to patients, oftentimes they'll feel like they are returning the favor to you, I find, uh, and also kind of uh, furthering research in their community uh, and improving the health of their communities. So by doing that, we're working to improve the health literacy, not just of that patient, but oftentimes a, a, a small community around these diseases, making these words like prostate and cancer kind of dinner table conversations uh, and not something that they only hear about in the doctor's office. And then, you know, I ask my, I would suggest that you ask your coordinators to think about barriers to uh, participation. Um, so if a patient says no, uh, to entry, oftentimes we would, we, we would record why did they say no? Why did they not want to participate? Sometimes it's just no time. Sometimes it's not interested in research, but sometimes it's um, too many visits, can't afford the parking, um, don't have a ride. There are sometimes that are things that we can actually address that we've been able to offer to people that seems to have driven up our, our numbers. Next. So that's all I have for you. I'll take any questions if you'd like to ask some. Hey, Adam, this is Sean. I had a quick question for you. Yeah. Relative to, for example, COVID-19, which you did reference, and I know that has nothing to do with the work that you're doing, how, how did we do as a country in terms of recruiting, uh, and I, I probably should know this better, uh, recruiting um, ethnic patients towards these COVID-19 trials and, and in terms of and how are we doing overall in terms of dissemination of the vaccine relative to some of the barriers that you've discussed? Do you, do you have any idea or, you know, because it's not obviously limited to just men who are of a screening age of prostate cancer, it's for everyone. So yeah. it really maybe is a good, uh, litmus test for how we're doing overall and, and did we do better? Uh, it, so you can look, I've looked at some of the uh, vaccine trials and there was quite a bit of variability in the amount of minorities that they enrolled, but they actually did better than a lot of the cancer trials because some patients were actually being offered $1,000 African-Americans, $1,500 to, to participate in the vaccine trials early on. Um, it was what most people would have considered a coercive amount. Uh, but uh, they did get reasonable numbers in many of them. Uh, but there was a really, really strong effort to do so uh, in the COVID-19 space. Um, there are definitely trials that were well below, but they did pretty good with, um, with elderly, with people with comorbidities, and there was a very purposeful uh, re recruitment design for a lot of the COVID-19 vaccines. Got it, thank you. Hey Adam, it's uh, David Vanderweel. Thanks a lot, really comprehensive, really from like small things, adjustments we could be making here to thinking globally or like much broader, you know, grant reviews, thinking way in advance. Um, you talked about, I know we talked about in our GU team, um, and actually, this is kind of related to what you just talked about, about the $1,000 reward or 1500 not reward, but, you know, coercive payments. And, and you talked about, you know, including money in your grants for uninsured patients. And I, I think when you brought that up, you got some pushback from our clinical trials office, uh, you know, in the moment. I guess my question is, has this been implemented? Have you implemented this? More often, have you gotten pushed back? Have you found a way to overcome that from the IRB? The fact that, in general, everybody's supposed to be able to get the same compensation, or like if you can't pay for one person's MRI but have insurance cover it, 
for a different patient, that sort of thing. Um, you know, with people not coming from equitable situations, can you treat them, quote, unequally, whereas most of the time we frown upon that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had to have conversations with both Strozier's and Northwestern's IRB, and as you know, the SRC about it. Um, and I, uh, the head of the, one of the heads of the IRB at Strozier is Dr. Mulane, who was on the study that you and I submitted together, David. And uh, the statement was the same. I said, the reality of it is, is that you are, when, you know that we wouldn't even offer this study to an uninsured patient. Um, they just wouldn't be able to afford it. So I considered it equity to basically expand inclusion to include those people. Uh, right. So that was the argument that I had to use uh, both at Northwestern and at Strozier. And I told them that the NIH uh, obviously approved the grant this way because I explicitly wrote it into it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's like, well, maybe it's a moot point if if the IRBs agreed with you, but obviously this is something that the NIH cares about a lot as well. And I'm wondering if we can lobby them to sort of, one, I guess, write letters on your behalf if that's needed, or two, make a statement about it that, you know, trying to treat everybody equitably is actually not equitable because they're not coming from the same place. And Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, so I remind them that equality is what they're talking about, and I'm talking about equity, which is to make everyone have the equal ability to access the same services. Uh, yeah. It's just doing the same thing across the board, regardless of what their situation is. Uh, and so I call myself doing it equitably. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, the NCI just actually asked, for feedback last week uh, in an email uh, about how they can improve their uh, diversity initiatives. And so they asked me, and I'm sure lots of people, uh, to send them an email about kind of what we suggested, and I highlighted that fact uh, in the email to Tiffany Wells. Yeah, that's great. And you know, I, I'm just hearing this when we're talking about budget negotiations for trials. Um, you know, we should be telling our budget office we should always be asking for some money for transportation. Um, you know, that's in in the overall budget. That's going to be pennies. But if it's not there, we can't offer it. So, yes. uh, yeah, that's an easy thing for us to be doing uh, right away, I think, implement. Yes. A lot of it is easy. There's something yeah, this, easier, but I, you know, you're right. It's, it's, there's a lot. You know, in my old cancer center in Texas, I had a, we had a benevolence fund, which was basically for just like a catch all for people who had issues affording this or that or weren't covered. And we could dip into the benevolence fund to help them. Does Northwestern have anything like that? It would be for, it would serve all trials, essentially. I don't know if that's true. That would be great if it was. We, uh, I mean, I know about Northwestern has charity care, right? But I don't know about like for trials. Each time I've had to uh, write for, uh, you know, bus cards or and parking passes uh, for every study I've ever written, um, and I just put it in the budget. But it it would be great if that were. Yeah, yeah I think I think um, the a few things. One. Um, First of all, thank you again for speaking tonight, um, particularly going into a, like a, a long weekend. It's really appreciated. Two, I've learned two things solidly from you about minority recruitment, you know, from what you've done and from this talk, which is you, know, you have to plan ahead, budget it, make strong partnerships, and be thinking about, like you said, uh, um, you know, equity, not, not equality, and making sure you're reaching everybody. And the third thing, I think it is something MK, as we talk to donors and whatnot, I think that it is an area we can really think about is should we have a benevolence fund because sometimes unforeseen costs come depending on who did your budget they're not very flexible and then you don't you know you don't want to have protocol deviations or people drop out just because you know they couldn't you know make the 50 bucks to make a couple car trips or not or not to head in but really great talk adam really appreciate you being here you're welcome I, we did negotiate with radiology at both sites on a fixed cost per mri for research um, 
and it, it's a protocol, which whatever protocol you you ask them to do for the for it, it has a specific cost, and that's what we put into the MRI budget into the grant budget. Anything else? Well, thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday weekend. You all too, and thanks for the invite. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. You're welcome.